welcome um, Sarah Hammerschlag, who today will talk on religion after Emmanuel Levinas, uh, Emmanuel Levinas's Talmud and the crafting of a post-Christian Judaism. Please welcome Sarah Hammerschlag. First, thank you, Richard, for that really lovely introduction. I think I flew all the way to Santa Barbara to hear a former teacher of mine talk about me in such terms. Um, I have to say that I said this to Richard last night. Um, it's been a long time since I was at, I was even in Santa Barbara, but since I was at UCSB, but I think of Richard all the time as one of the greatest teachers that I have ever had in the classroom, taught me more than anyone has taught me about what great pedagogy is. How do you create a classroom with real suspense, with a real sense that something is at stake? And, um, and so it's just an enor enormous honor to be here and to get to share in this wonderful event, which is really an event that celebrates you and what you've done in the past 25 years. So I just am thrilled to be a part of it. So um, I want to begin today with a quote. Let me ask first, how many of you have know anything about Emmanuel Levinas? Is this all, oh, some of you do, okay. Um, okay, so some of this is entirely new. I have written this in such a way that you don't really have to know anything about Levinas, but I just don't know what to assume, in fact, because I think Shai Agnon is probably somebody that you're more familiar with. Um, but Richard asked me to actually, essentially teach one of Levinas's Talmud readings. So, so that's what I've really decided to do, to just, I have, if you read my work, which you may um, at some point, uh, I have a very ultimately critical perspective on Levinas, but I have decided to suspend that for today um, and to really try to give him the most charitable reading that I can um, in the effort of thinking about what he was after in his very project of, of taking up the, uh, a yearly reading of a page of Talmud for the colloquium of Jewish intellectuals of the French language. So I want to really orient us around this quote, which is from this reading from 1966, which was the eighth meeting of the colloquium of Jewish intellectuals. Um, and the theme of that meeting was, le monde a-t-il besoin du juif? Does the world need the Jew? Now I'll read it first, and then I'll talk a little bit about what it means to actually even have that question as the theme of a meeting. There is no notion of the masses in the idea the Jewish people has of itself. All belong, or must belong, to the elite. But Judaism does not affirm any national or racial pride by this. It teaches what, in its opinion, is possible for man. It is gendered. So I, I found myself thinking throughout Wendy's presentation that Levinas does deserve a feminist reading. He's had quite a few, but he could always deserve another. And it is through this teaching, perhaps, that the world needs Judaism, that after all, that after all is more interesting than the monotheistic theology that the world has, in many respects, assimilated. We will see that our text goes further, but before proceeding, let us emphasize one more important thing, and this is one of Levinas's key insights. Morality begins in us, not in institutions which are not able to protect it. It demands that human honor knows how to exist without a flag. Now I'll begin at the end of this quote, in fact, to think about what it means to talk about honor without a flag, and we'll work our way through the text. But I want to begin, first of all, with this idea that the, that the Eighth Colloquium was titled, Does the World Need the Jew? I mean, I found myself thinking this morning, what a strange idea this is to have as the theme of a meeting. First of all, the question is, who's asking? Who gets to ask, does the world need the Jew? And it is the Juif. So there is the sense that it is about Judaism, but it's also the, the, the Jew itself. If someone is asking, doesn't that suggest that there is some kind of question? In other words, should that question even be asked? Should any people or tradition need to justify its existence? But then finally, what changes if it is a group of Jewish intellectuals themselves asking the question? And in many ways, that's what's at stake in thinking about the project that I want to describe today. So hopefully, you'll think about these questions as we proceed th through the material. But first, I really do want to give you some background on both Levinas and on the project of the colloquium. Okay. <laughs> 
So first, on the philosopher and Jewish intellectual Emmanuel Levinas, then I'll talk a little bit about the colloquium of Jewish intellectuals where Levinas gave the lecture. And then finally, we'll turn to the specific contribution which you have here. I don't expect you all to have read it, but in case you would, I will, I will contextualize what's happening in that text and use our passage as a way to get into what's at stake in this text. So another connection to Wendy's presentation, Levinas was born in Kovno, Lithuania, in fact. He was raised in, however, a modern but observant Jewish family. He became a naturalized French citizen in the late 1930s after he studied at the University of Strasbourg in eastern France. During this time at the University of France, he began to study philosophy and then went to Freiburg and became a student first of the phenomenologist Edmund Husserl and then of Martin Heidegger a relationship that would haunt Levinas for the rest of his life, given Heidegger's role in the Nazi party. In the early years of his intellectual career in the 1930s, Levinas's publications were primarily commentaries on these two German philosophers, and it was famously Levinas's book, The Theory of Intuition in Husserl's Phenomenology that introduced Jean-Paul Sartre to the phenomenological method. For this method of doing philosophy opened up the possibility of interpreting everyday life. As Raymond Aron described it to Sartre, the new philosophy would make even the apricot cocktail on their table a subject of philosophical inquiry. We'll come back a little bit um, to Sartre at the end. So during those years leading up to the war, Levinas, despite his growing influence, did not hold a university position, but he actually worked in an administrative job at the Alliance Israelite Universelle. This is the first Jewish international aid organization, which opened Jewish schools around the Mediterranean basin. And it, there's a lot of work being done on this organization right now um, in very interesting ways. It introduced Mizrahi Jews to the French language, culture, and thought. And after the war, Levinas would take up a long-standing position as the director of ENIO, which was the Paris Lycée or high school that trained students to become teachers back in their home countries. Um, it was in the auditorium of this school that the 1966 meeting of the colloquium took place. More on that soon. It's important to say that while Levinas was an observant Jew throughout his life, his attention to Jewish text and even to Jewish thought properly construed really only took hold after World War II. And it is, I would argue, his wartime experience that in fact lay the groundwork for his entire philosophical oeuvre, including his interest in the way he conceived of the Jewish tradition. And this brings us back to our passage and to this idea of honor without a flag. I'll spend a fair amount of time thinking about this phrase. So throughout Levinas's corpus, this phrase is linked to the moment of France's surrender to the Germans. A member of the French army, Levinas was mobilized in 1939 and taken prisoner in June of 1940 before the French surrender. Protected by the uniform under the 1929 Geneva Connection Convention, Levinas avoided the fate of those French Jews rounded up first in Paris and then after 1942 in the south of France and deported to Auschwitz. Instead, he was held in a labor camp for Jewish soldiers in northern Germany where he worked as a logger. At the camp, after the fall of night, he was able to read by candlelight and to write. And during this time in the army, and then during his years in captivity, he kept extensive notebooks in which he traced out his philosophical ideas, reflected on his readings, and even sketched out early drafts of two novels. They're not great literature, but they are quite interesting if you're interested in his project. Throughout these notebooks, he returns again and again to what was revealed at the moment that civilization receded. And he talks about it in such striking terms. The wartime the, would appear as the non-ethical world, the non-ethical world. Or more precisely, as the world from which social mores and political structures undergirding morality had vanished, as though all the things that were propping up moral life had suddenly just disappeared. He remembers the fall of France in 1940 in exactly these terms, as the dropping away of all forms of culture. I have to get back to screen five. Okay, here we go. Um, a world, he writes, where there was no more France, plus de France. It had departed in the night like an immense circus tent, leaving a clearing strewn with debris. 
It's a world which had lost its meaning, but thus also the world, he says, from which all the fog had lifted, in which one reaches the things themselves. In other words, morality itself appeared like something covering over the real world. These notebooks would lay the groundwork for all of Levinas' future philosophical work, his magnum opus, Totality Infinity, as well as the major work that followed otherwise than being. At the same time, it was also here that Levinas began to muse on Judaism, on the experience of being Jewish, and what role it could or should play in the post-war context. He was, in fact, thinking quite a bit about what he would do when he got home. In other words, to return to our first question, to the ultimately indisputable fact that for Levinas, the world needed Judaism. It needed it badly. And he, this is, in some sense, at the heart, I think, of everything he does after the world. This, this sense, this, this idea, and this commitment to introducing a certain version of Judaism to a world from which the moral structures had disappeared. In the years before 1966, the year of our passage, the claim took multiple forms in his writings, but it was always tied to the realization of what happens when civilization absconds, disappearing like a circus tent in the night, leaving only debris and rubble. Being Jewish meant for Levinas a more intense exposure to the world. And in the notebooks and in essays written soon after his return from captivity, he mused on how this experience in a Nazi lager connected him to Judaism. As he put it in a 1945 essay, to implore God as a prisoner in the camps had its own mythic dimensions. It wasn't merely to repeat the pleas of the patriarchs, he suggested. It was to feel God's presence in the burning of the suffering, distinguish the flame of the divine kiss. Election and suffering are indistinguishable for him. In ex the feeling of suffering, he experienced divine presence. What is Judaism, he concludes? If not the experience since Isaiah, since Job, of the possible return before hope at the depth of despair, of the pain in happiness, the discovery of the signs of election in suffering itself. This experience tied him to the biblical patriarchs and prophets. He compared himself to Abraham, to Job, and Isaiah. And at the same time, it connected him to the whole history of Jewish persecution. Being Jewish, he wrote in an essay written about the same time as our passage, is a strange election. To be Jewish is to be a member of a people conditioned and situated among the nations in such a way that it is liable to find itself without forewarning in the wretchedness of its exile, ghetto, its desert, ghetto, or concentration camp. All the splendors of life swept away like tinsel, reduced to an inner morality that is belied by the universe. On the one hand, the sit claim seems clear it's the fact of Jewish suffering that marks out the Jewish condition. It was Jewish exile, diaspora, the Jews' historically nationless status that made the Jewish people subject to suffering and thus ironically privileged by a kind of divine election, one experienced through the very experience of subjection. But suffering alone doesn't make one moral, does it? The world doesn't need Jews in order only to witness suffering. Wouldn't that be perverse? Of course, before trying to show how Levinas gets from suffering to ethics, I should say that some have suggested that there is something perverse, or at least masochistic, in Levinas's mode of thought. During the years between 45 and 66, he was developing his vision on Judaism. Levinas was also developing his philosophical corpus. And at its center was this notion that ethics is first philosophy. Let me try to explain what this means. In the description of the human being, in his philosophical works, he describes the person not as an agent of rights or privileges, according to a classical liberal model, but as first and foremost subjected to the other, the other person, with whom I come face to face. This is not just the case for Jews, for Levinas, but rather it's actually a fact of humanity, and, but it can be revealed philosophically. We can trace the importance of this idea for Levinas, however, back to this idea of human honor without a flag with which I began. If morality does not come from society, where does it come from? 
That world shorn of tinsel and decoration was the starting point too of Levinas's philosophy, and he, it represented what he called the ilia, the there is, a world of sheer force. Humans are subjected to that world, he theorized, but also have the capacity to interrupt that world of forces. The question for him, and this was a question going back pretty far in his work, was what could interrupt force that wasn't itself force? For Levinas, the answer was not reason, as it was for somebody like Immanuel Kant, but rather he theorized it was through the interruption of something that has to say no to reason itself an interruption of our human tendency to consume, whether literally or figuratively, all that presents itself. That interruption, he argued, is the face of the other, the other person. He said that the other person says no to my powers. In other words, when I encounter another person, I might want to give that person a series of attributes. I might want to think of that person in terms that I can relate to all other things in the world, and in that sense, to know them. But he suggests that knowledge is not actually what happens in the genuine face-to-face -face encounter. Instead, there's a transcendence that one encounters, and he calls it something like the trace of the divine. And what it means is that I can, I, what I recognize is my incapacity to know the other person as I would know an object or a feature in the world. And that, he says, pulls me back, pushes me back onto myself, and I feel a sense of shame, a sense of shame that I thought that I could go out and know a person as I could know a thing. And that sense of shame is the beginning for him of responsibility, and that is at the heart of this idea of what it means to say that ethics is first philosophy. It is this fact that he theorizes as the possibility of an ethics that does not need the infrastructure of nation or society. Okay, but if that's true, so what role Judaism, right? If this is intrinsic to the nature of human interaction, does the world need Jews? If so, how and why? So, so far, this is what we've established. We've established that the experience of Jewish persecution put Levinas in touch with the dangers of society's collapse or disappearance. And that as he experienced that, he felt connected to the tradition as an attestation of persecution. Judaism could be theorized, finally, as a witness to that possibility, an election to it. But is that all, merely an election to persecution? Before answering that question, I want to give you a little bit more background on the kind of political world in which he was living. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of French Judaism. I don't know how familiar any of you are with this, and about the colloquium in which Levinas was giving this presentation, and finally about the place of the Talmud for Levinas and why it became his means of intervention in this colloquium. So the answer to the second part of this question, is this all, I want to give you some background here, right? And that's first on French Judaism. It was the first nation to emancipate its Jews. France was widely seen in the 19th century as a kind of utopia for les Israelites. Unlike in Germany, where Jewish rights were alternately proffered and rescinded throughout the 19th century, stabilizing finally only with Germans, Germany's unification under the leadership of Bismarck, in France, citizenship arrived almost coincidentally with the revolution, almost coincidentally. While neither Jews nor Protestants were originally understood to be included in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, final equality under the law did come around after a protracted debate in 1791. All Jews were granted citizenship with the explicit contention that French citizenism, citizenship replaces the corporate membership of Jews in their kehilot, their religious communities. The success of Jewish assimilation was premised on the idea that when granted the means and the rights to participate in the life of the nation, Jews would gladly sacrifice the form of life that had kept them set apart from fellow countrymen. While Judaism did not disappear in France, as both the early reformers and Napoleon had in fact hoped, the identification it produced among French Jews with their fatherland was profound. By the centenary of the revolution in 1889, French Jews had come to see France itself as the modern inheritor of the Mosaic legacy. The Alliance, where Levinas worked, which I just described, had the express mission of spreading French values to Jewish people across the Mediterranean. These Jewish schools, they weren't teaching Jewish content, right? They were going to places where people had Jewish content. They were teaching French ideals and French civilization. In fact, the mission statement of this organization read like this. <laughs> 
I think I have it on here. Yes, okay. If you believe that the influence of the principles of 89 is all powerful in the world, that the example of peoples who enjoy absolute religious equality is a force, Israelites of the entire world, come give us your membership, your cooperation. Identification with the state of France was indeed understood by the organization as a viable means of expressing one's commitment to Judaism, as though they were totally simpatico. For some prominent Jews, the civilizing mission itself became their, their primary form of expression of their Judaism. For others, there was also the matter of reforming the Jewish tradition to make it align with Republican values. The latter was something of a prerequisite for Judaism's continued existence. Under the organizational system put in place by Napoleon, French Judaism was constituted to parallel the other two dominant French religious traditions the Protestant and the Catholic Church. It was designed to be a confession, so oriented around belief. And its rabbis were, until the first decade of the 20th century, employees of the state. Judaism was thus defined strictly in confessional terms as a belief system, and perhaps more importantly, universalist terms such that its fundamental teachings were understood not only to be consonant with French universalism, but foundational or fundamental to it. Efforts to identify Judaism with the Republic were so successful that La Croix, the leading newspaper in 1889, referred to the centenary celebration of the Republic as the Semitic centen centenary. When Levinas speaks in our passage of a monotheistic theology, that the world had largely assimilated. We can go back all the way to that. He's referring to this idea that Jewish monotheism, prophetic monotheism, was itself the precursor of the French Republic. That it was by means of a shared sensibility that Jewish existence was justified in France. A myriad of French Jewish texts from the late 19th century and early 20th century, this is part of what my um, anthology that Richard mentioned attests to, emphasized this consonance between Judaism and a French sensibility. If they went further, it was only to describe Judaism's prophetic monotheism as not only in line with, but in fact, the original and therefore at the heart of the best of the West. But after the war, France's Jews felt, of course, a profound sense of betrayal. Jews in France did fare better in World War II than almost any other nation occupied by the Nazis. About 75,000 of France's 300,000 Jews were sent to concentration camps, but the rest survived through various means, primarily through a highly effective underground network throughout the south of France. Nonetheless, during and after the war, Jews in France, they had to come to terms with the fact that it was not the Nazis who had inst instituted racial laws, it was their own government. For a community that had largely come to see itself as exemplary in the French tr Republic, as embodying it, of embodying France's universalist and republican values, the stripping away of its French identity, it constituted, as you can imagine, a profound trauma. For many, the myth of the French greatness and the role of its Jews as its great ambassadors, it had to be replaced. Identification with the history of Jewish suffering through their wartime experience was one means by which this generation who returned after the war, that they forged a new sense of their identity in this European nation. And that's where the colloquium of Jewish intellectuals comes in. I'll hold on to the slide on at the moment. So this project, what was this colloquium of Jewish intellectuals? It was one means of shaping and giving form to that identity, a newfound Jewish consciousness. It led many young intellectuals in the decade following the war to a kind of cultural awakening, to the reading of biblical and rabbinic sources, and to a renewed interest in traditional practice. The cloak was initiated as a means of organizing these impulses, but doing so would involve also the rethinking of what it meant to be a Jewish intellectual in France. And so from the beginning, in fact, this question, does the world need Judaism, was it actually at the colloque's center. But it was only at this 1966 meeting from which this reading comes that it was for the first time actually made explicit. And that's the reason why I chose it as our reading um, today, because the meeting itself addressed head on this question, what would the role of Judaism be in this new world? But it asks it in this provocative way. <laughs> 
And by, the, by this time, Levinas's Talmudic readings had themselves become something of a tradition. They were at the center of his project to resignify what it meant to think of Judaism as a religion. And indeed, to re-signify this very terminology, which had been associated with this parallel between Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism, and which made Judaism kind of, der of a derivative of it. Levinas's project was to argue that no, actually Judaism was the first and the only tradition that could truly embody this term. It was the religion par excellence, and that is to say, the source for teaching what it means to talk about honor without the flag. Okay, so with all this background, um, let's talk a little bit about the colloquium and Levinas's Talmudic readings, but I did want to give you all a chance at this point to ask any questions about the enormous amount of information and background I just gave you. Do any of you, yeah, Wendy, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me about the Dreyfus Affair is that I think there were many Jews for whom they were able to dismiss it as a kind of blip. And it was, I mean, and the thing about the period between the Dreyfus Affair and World War II is that it's also a period in which there is this influx of Eastern European Jews. But I'm sorry, you, did you want to ask them? No, no, they just handed me a microphone oh, okay. after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing the second half of that. Um, I mean, it's certainly the moment in which you start to see Zionist expression among the French Jewish community. That's true. True, and so this other group that I've been tracking, which is the French Jewish Scouts, who were very important as a youth movement, they became more inclusive, which meant they allowed Zionist participation, but it was never the dominant ideology, um, and explicitly not. And the place in which I see this most acutely is in the Alliance's uh, mission statements and in their expression of what their beliefs entail. They don't reverse their anti-Zionist position until after World War II, and I think that's because of the desire to fit this description of what France means when it refers to what a religion or a confession can mean, and that means that nationhood is not part of the deal for Judaism, right? It can't be. Yeah, I'm sorry, in the back first and then, yeah. Thank you. I am, I am laboring to remember the thesis of Bernard-Henri Lévy, uh, his book, The Genius of the Jews, I read uh, many years ago. He may have actually been a Taubman Wasn't presenter at one yeah. time. Yeah, I remember that. And you know, his, his, his thesis was that the Jews were really the creators of uh, modern French culture and, and the civilization of uh, liberty, fraternity, equality that, that became a part of the, the French nation and, and, and the essence of uh, French thought and expression in the world. Uh, could you comment, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, so he's reclaiming, I mean, when I read to you this idea of the this, this centenary of the Jews, of course, that was being written by a right-wing newspaper who saw this sort of derogatory in their royalist sensibility. So the interesting thing is how that identification was at a certain moment seen as a way of denigrating Judaism. And so what does it mean to reclaim it? I mean, I think where Levinas goes a step quite a bit further than Bernard Henri Levy, and we'll see that when I proceed in the in the text, is to rethink what the relationship between liberté and fraternité in a, in a radical way that rejects that the liberal subject is actually, truly should be at its center. But Bernard Henri Lévy was also understood himself as a student of Levinas and participated in um, the, um, the Institute of Levinas that uh, used to meet in Jerusalem and still meets in France, but now they almost never talk about Levinas, interestingly. But yeah, there's one more question. Thank you. I have never thought about Levinas and Levinas and some of these issues. When I visit Paris, as an example, and want to look at the Jewish museums, especially about the Holocaust or the, some of the memorials, and I'm told by many of the people there that this was something that was very politically charged. It was hard to actually create them. That de Gaulle actually did not want to be able to see them, so one was even put underground and it was their denial of their role in the Holocaust. And I wonder how that influenced what, uh, what Livinas has done. Yeah, I think that, I think that, that you, it's very interesting if you track basically his writings between 45 and this um, essay that we're reading for today, because you can feel the resentment at how easily French society just re 
produced itself. And um, this is particularly the case in his response. I mean, so this essay that, that Richard just mentioned that I wrote about Levinas and Sartre is really about what it must have been like for Levinas, who essentially introduced Sartre to phenomenology and was actually writing, he has a note in his notebook that says being and nothingness, like as though that was a project that he was going to embark upon. And he comes back home and discovers the world all in the thrall of Sartre. I mean, and it's in so far as this connects to your question, the big question, I think, the debate in France until the 1980s was whether one could ever single out the Jews as victims because the whole French nation understood itself as a victim. And so this anxiety around <laughs> its guilt and complicity, I think, is, gets worked out through that debate. Okay, I'm going to move on. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Given that uh, Levinas was a prisoner of war, when did he become aware of the full scope of the Holocaust? You know, I don't know the exact answer to that question, partially because the notebooks only run through essentially a, maybe six months after his return. But I feel like it's clear from the notebooks that he understood while he was there. First of all, he was in northern Germany. He wasn't very far. I forget what was the camp, but he wasn't very far from a camp that was truly a real concentration camp. And he... And you have the sense that he, the other thing you find out about is that he can't, he gets no notice of his family, right? He has all of his family back in Lithuania and he hears nothing from them. And he, and you can see him reflecting in the notebooks about what this means. Um, and his daughter and his wife are in Paris and his daughter is being hidden in a convent, which of course also means that she's being exposed to Catholicism. Um, and he has a great anxiety about that as well. Um, so I feel, and he also knows while he's at the camp, I think he knows, he f experiences the victory of the Allies as a miracle that's like a biblical miracle. And for him, it renews, he says, the sort of, the true, the aspect of the Jewish tradition that is a truth for children, the idea that the biblical miracle could become literal. I think that gives us a sense that he had a very clear sense. Of course, maybe not imagistically, maybe not statistically, but, but uh, that, this, that what was at stake was in fact um, the existence of the Jewish people. Okay, so let me return um, to our meeting. So to return to this quote, Levinas doesn't use the term religion here, but he does reject the idea that what makes Judaism special is any kind of national or racial pride. Rather, he says, it's a teaching, a teaching of what is possible for the human being. It is this teaching that explains why the world needs Judaism. By this point in 1966, he'd already given the term religion a special status in his philosophical writings. He defines the term as this bond with alterity, what I was describing as this face-to-face -face relation with the other, that which interrupts totality. So religion is the possibility for transcendence to enter into the world, but it happens through the other person, through the face-to-face -face relationship. So the question then that animates his Talmudic reading is how to work out the relationship between this revelation and something that's, that is universalizable, be dis discoverable. It's universalizable, this, co this concept religion. Religion is not something that only refers to Judaism. And so he has to make this connection, what is the special relationship that the Jewish tradition has to it? And the Talmudic readings become one of the spaces that he does that. So let me talk just a little bit about the genre very quickly, about what they were um, and how they functioned at the colloque. Um, so at the first colloque, Levinas gave no formal presentation, but he stated very clearly in response to a presentation by the cultural attache of Israel, what he saw the role of the colloque to be in this post-war world. To the attache of Israel's claim that the future of Judaism lie in the state of Israel, in its capacity both to overcome centuries of diaspora life and to collect all the disparate features of the tradition represented across the globe, Levinas said that would no longer be Judaism, that would be a museum. Instead, he argued the task of the colloque and indeed the task for the Jewish tradition going forward was to answer this question. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay, here it is. How must we live today 
Where is justice to be found, and in what sense can the things of Europe, which are also admirable and to which we are also attached, how can they be rectified by an authentic Jewish tradition? So we can map this statement onto our initial passage with precision. If the war had shown how fragile civilization was, all the things so admirable about Europe, Judaism had to offer an alternative path to the restitution of justice through texts, tradition, and because of Europe, and this was because Europe's dominant traditions had failed, and he very clearly thought this, that Christianity had shown itself to be a failure, otherwise it would have protected Europe as an ethos from the great disaster, from the deluge. It was therefore only the victims of Europe's violence that could maintain a moral high ground, only the Jews who could have the capacity to reinstate an ideal of justice. And by the third meaning of the colloque, it was by way of the Talmud that Levinas would make this claim. Now it's important to say that Levinas did not grow up studying Talmud, and in fact his path to the genre is itself worthy of much discussion. Um, it was by way of the mysterious figure Shushani, which I feel like whenever I speak in a large public audience, which this is not, um, that somebody has some story about Shushani. Um, but if you don't know who he was, I'll just say a tiny bit about him. Um, he was a, a mysterious figure, a vagabond and a prodigy who never revealed his true identity, but traveled the world offering his wisdom on everything from Talmud to mathematics and physics. Um, and it was by way of his friends, and, and Shushani lived above him in the school for a while, and there are amazing stories about what a hoarder he was. Apparently you couldn't even get into the room, it was so stacked with books and food and objects. And Elie Wiesel, who was also a student of his, described him as a just a mean and terrible teacher. Levinas never talks about his personality, but he insists on crediting Shushani with all of his Talmudic wisdom, and he says that everything that he'd written in the Talmudic lectures was written in the shadow of his shadow. What does that mean, whether this was really the source of Levinas' insights? If you read Levinas' philosophy and his Talmudic readings, it's abundantly clear that they are laced through with Levinas' own philosophy. So one interesting question is why does he want Shushani to be a source of, of why does he want to foreground his influence? And I think in some sense it's to claim somebody who had this sort of status of being a great sage of the past, that this would actually give him the authority that he did not have as somebody who in fact wasn't trained in the tradition. It, it gives the teacher himself this kind of mythic status, which I think is also intrinsic to his project. But what is clear is that Levinas's Rashi courses, which were his Saturday sessions um, at his school, would not have happened if not for this encounter counter, um, and that Shushani gave him a kind of liberty to read the Talmud in a way that was not historical. And there's a new book by Ethan Kleinberg that thinks about how radically untraditional Levinas's own approach to the Talmud was. What he wanted out of it was the Jewish equivalent of philosophical knowledge. He wanted to, so it's very different, it's interesting to think about Agnon versus Levinas here in the sense that it's not the texture, it's not the terms, it's not the debates, it's not the figures, it's not on the level of the particular. It is, in fact, he even says that you have to sort of scrape through the particular to get to the philosophical core. Sometimes he even uses the term spirit and letter. He says you have to get past the letter of the text to get to the spirit. So what he wanted was to extricate the universal intentions from the apparent particularism. And as he put it in the, that's what he says that actually literally in the, the introduction to his four readings. So what made the Talmud the right source for Jewish wisdom was of course its continuity, the sense in which it had been studied, he says this in, in, in the introduction, from antiquity into modernity. It thus represented the possibility for dialogue with the past, the possibility for making the past speak to the present. And in that sense, that continuity was one of the, and his this focus on, on commentary and conversation and interpretation was one of the ways he both justified his method and for grounded the Talmud. So a renewed attention to the Talmud was important to this post-war Jewish survival. It was as important, he actually says, as the establishment of the state of Israel. And in fact, he says, it was so important that the primary task of the state of Israel ought to be to protect the Talmud. He says that 
this is the, the this project, insofar as Israel can protect the Talmud, it will be the source of a post-Christian Judaism. And there is, as you'll see as we proceed a little further, a hint that without this protection of the Talmud, that if the state of Israel does not become the protector of the Talmud, that Israel would be a menace to the world. That if Israel as a state does not see its primary duty as, the, as protecting the Talmud, it will as a state become a menace to the world. So with this in mind, let's actually turn to this reading, as old as the world. This is the title he gives to the Talmud of reading on the theme, Does the World Need the Jew? So the Mishnah, which you have in the first couple of pages, you have the Mishnah and the Gemara, because he always begins with it. Um, it's from Sanhedrin 36b, 37a, and it describes the structure of the Sanhedrin, the rabbinic court that reigned in Jerusalem before the second exile, focusing on the fact that its members sat in a semicircle. It discusses how it maintained the number of judges, clerks, and students by moving one person up when necessary from one echelon of the court to the next. Now the Gemara is primarily an application of the Song of Songs, verse three, chapter seven, your navel is like a rounded goblet full of fragrant wine, your belly like a heap of wheat hedged about with roses to the Sanhedrin. Thus an application of exactly what Wendy was talking about insofar as there is a femininity here, it is seen as metaphorical for the Sanhedrin itself. Now the Gemara explains how Understanding this verse as about the Sanhedrin explains the status of the Sanhedrin as at the center of the universe and thus its principles of justice. So what concerns Levinas first and foremost, and indeed is the central concern of the passage, is what it means that the Gemara declares the Sanhedrin to be just that, the center of the universe. It's this claim that gives rise to his title, as old as the world. And he really asked the question, doesn't every great civilization declare itself as such, as old as the world? And he asks, is such a claim any different from the Greeks who declared Delphi the navel of the world? And then he asks, if this were the case for the Jews, would Judaism be anything other than a kind of nationalism? And that's a degrading term for Levinas. The idea of a nation, he says, arises each time a human group thinks itself at the center or the navel of the world. Now, I think that itself is a question worth thinking about. Is it true that any time a civilization declares itself at the navel of the world, that nationalism is at stake? And so I add one more question for you to think about for us to discuss at the end. So certainly one might read the first slide, the first line of our passage, so to go back to it. with its claim that all belong to the elite as declaring a kind of Jewish superiority. In fact, I have to say, if you were to look through Levinas's corpus for evidence that he believed in the superiority of Judaism, it wouldn't be so hard to find. So how can he claim that this superiority is not nationalism? And for Levinas, the key to both claiming the superiority of Judaism and claiming it's not a nationalist is the category of religion. He has to hold on to it, right? Um, even as he wants to reshape Judaism as not modeled on Catholicism and Protestantism. Religion for Levinas, as I said, refers to this relation with alterity. He also thinks of it as the introduction of the supernatural into the natural world. So in their embrace of paganism, of force, that's what the Nazis lacked, he will say, the supernatural. They were pagans. But what Levinas means by the supernatural is not some personal manifestation of the divine or some miracle of strength. It's about the human capacity to locate a means of surpassing what is natural. So to go back to when I was describing his philosophy, what it is that can interrupt force if it's not force, that possibility is for Levinas the supernatural. So what, again, what is most natural is the world of forces, the world shorn of civilization and thus civility. The world as it is is a world of forces, and yet there is the supernatural capacity that human beings have. And that's what he says right after the passage that appears on the bottom of 81. Um, and this is what he means when he says that the Talmud teaches what is possible for man. So now I need to find slide 10. Yes, the Jew is perhaps the one 
who because of the inhuman history he has undergone, understands the suprahuman demands of morality, the necessity of finding within oneself the source of one's moral certainties. He knows that only a hedge of roses, this refers back to the Song of Songs verse, right? Separates him from his own fall. He always suspects thorns beneath those roses. One has to find within oneself that certainty that this barrier was the real obstacle. This is actually a moment of significant irony in the text because we might expect him here to be speaking of a kind of inner strength, a fortitude, but actually the answer is not in strength, it's in the superhuman demand of morality. What's superhuman is not something that human beings have as a capacity, it's in the demand that morality makes upon me. Insofar as Jews have strength, in fact, this is their weakness. So this is a really interesting moment to go back to what he's saying about Israel. He says, the mere fact of race is not a guarantee against evil. The Talmud saw and said better than anyone and with nearly unbearable force. The Jew without the law is a threat to the world. Here's my reference to why it's so important that Israel hold on, um, that, that Israel makes the Talmud the center of its project. The Jew without the law is a threat to the world. The Jew without mitzvot is a threat to the world. In the tractate Beitza 25b, we are taught that the Torah was given to the toughest people there is, and if had it not been given to it, or if the Jewish people were to lose it, no people on earth could resist it. And then he says, an anti-Semitic outlook in the Talmud that has some spice to it. He seems to almost enjoy the sense in which there's something that, that he is actually himself, and we get the, back to this provocation of what is, does the world need Jews, that there's actually some truth to the idea that the Jews could be, by nature, a menace to the world. It's only the law that, in fact, keeps that from being the case. How ironically does he mean that? How can we take that? It's a question that I don't have an answer to, but I hope that we can engage as we discuss the passage. But let's return to the former passage. Oh, no, let's return to this one, to the one about the hedge of roses. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. Um, okay, so he knows that only a hedge of roses separates him from his own fall. He always suspects thorns beneath those roses. One has to find within oneself that certainty that this barrier was the real obstacle. What does this mean? This is, in fact, I think a confusing passage. It's not strength that provides access to the superhuman. It occurs by means of a different relation, and this phrase, hedge of roses that comes from Song of Songs 7-3. Your belly is like a heap of wheat hedged with roses. Suga b'shoshanim. The verse seems to glorify the body as well as nature. So the Song of Songs passage seems to glorify the beauty of nature and the beauty of the feminine body. But of course, we know that hedges are famous in Judaism, right? The opening of Perkei Avot, build a hedge, siyag, around the Torah. So Levinas takes this hedge to signify the natural world on one level, right? Its beauty, but also its threat. The seduction of the rose and the threat of the thorn, as well as a different means of relating to this natural world. What Judaism counsels is a different relation that is not one only of need. So we go back to, there's an irony already to this question, does the world need Judaism? Well, what the world needs is a people who do not function only by need. So Levinas responds affirmatively, yes, the world needs Jews, but because they are people who have a relationship to the world that is something other. Judaism introduces a separation between the human being and the world through the mitzvot. The tradition, he writes, places a time for reflection between natural spontaneity and nature. This space is the space of ritual. This is the nature of the commandments. And with that in mind, let's go back one last time to our passage. Okay. I won't read it again, but I'll let you read it to yourself as I continue. The mitzvot constitute the teaching that make the Jewish people elite. 
the Talmud as a constant conversation between the past and present, and the community who engages both in the practice of mitzvot and the study of the law represent the means by which this teaching is carried forward. This teaching is a teaching of what is possible for man. This is me giving a gloss on the passage. Not by being stronger or even better in any metaphysical or racial sense, rather it's about a method a set of rules that make the natural world into not just an object of beauty, but into a hedge, something that has been tamed and something that has been made into something by human rule, that enacts a su supernatural relationship to it through pause, through ritual. Thus, Levinas says in the fourth line down, is more interesting that this is, this is more interesting than the monotheistic theology that the world has assimilated. It's actually a bold move in 1966, right? This is a moment when the world was on the cusp of throwing off rules, and Levinas asserts against the truism that Judaism provided ethical monotheism, a much easier thing for people to accept, that in fact, the world needs the Jews because of halachot, for the, because of halacha, for the very reason that they put in place between themselves and the world, this notion of a separation or a relationship to the world. If Levinas's notion of religion, the possibility of something to interrupt the forces of the world is universal, it is also utterly and completely forgettable. And that's where we can begin to think about why the world needs Judaism, right? In the midst of this world of forces, the roses are always a seduction, beauty and danger. Jews attest to this fact, right? through the history of their persecution, and they carry with them a means, a set of rules, more portable and more porous than a circus tent, a means to turn roses into a hedge. But even this is not enough, and here's our sort of last move. Levinas finally concludes in the last part of his lesson, the Gemara will go further, right? He says that here. There's one additional teaching, which he finds in the Gemara from this, from this page. It's tied to Rash Lakish's reference to the Gemara. Um, it is tied to Rash Lakish's reference to Genesis 27, 27. You'll find it in your Gemara. This is the story of Jacob donning Esau's clothes. And there's a wordplay here between the Hebrew begadev for clothing and th through a shift in devouling can also be read as bogadav or rebels. Isaac had a premonition, Levinas writes, of all the rebels that would come out of Jacob, but Jacob already bore the weight of all that rebellion. The teaching here, and this too, I think, is a space for the supernatural, is the idea that I'm not only responsible for my sins, but responsible for the sins of all others as well. In a sense, this is the elitism that Levinas is speaking of in our opening quote, an elitism not of nobility or strength, but of responsibility. It arises from not from superiority, but from humility. And here we return to the title, As Old as the World. Instead of asserting that Jews are as old as the world, Levinas actually comes down on denying this fact. So this is the reversal. We are not like the Greeks. Why? Because at the heart of Judaism is a teaching, we are not actually as old as the world. This is the condition of the creature, he writes. He writes this on page 85, not to be as old as the world. And it is this teaching that is central to the book of Job when God asks, where were you when I created the world? So if the Sanhedrin is the center of the universe, it is not because it's the connection to the universe's source, but rather a means towards the future. You were not there when the universe was created, but by virtue of that fact, by virtue of the fact that you come into a world in which damage has been done and crimes have been committed, for that reason, you are responsible for all. And here's the moment to go back to the relationship to liberté, fraternité, égalité. He writes, your liberty is fraternity. Now this might sound like a repetition of the consonants between Judaism and the French Republic. It's actually, I would argue, it's negation. The teaching that Levinas claims here is the means by which we overcome nature. It is the realization that we are not free. It's the opposite of the existential freedom that Sartre discovered after reading Levinas' book on Husserl and then taking up Heidegger. To say that your liberty is fraternity means your freedom is for the other as a hostage. It is not autonomy, but heteronomy. Your responsibility exceeds your rights. In that sense, it's very much a negation of this French ethos. For Levinas, and here I conclude, this is a realization that we all have within us, 
It's that shame, right, that I was talking about, that he thinks it's the heart of every human being. What sets Judaism apart is not only that it teaches this fact, but also that its exposure to the violence of the world is, I'm quoting him, perhaps only a fulfillment of this teaching although it happens unbeknownst to those who fulfill it. Now, I'll just read that one more time for you to think about it because the sort of sense in which the martyrs here, the, 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 the victims of the Shoah are for him martyrs in a religious sense, you can hear it in the sentence, right? Um, perhaps, so Judaism is perhaps only the fulfillment of this teaching, although it happens unbeknownst to those who fulfill it. But there's no triumphalism here. It's hardly a victory, but it is a means for rediscovering morality by this responsibility of carrying forward the tradition. And it teaches, he thinks, um, he teaches, Judaism teaches this capacity of resisting the world's forces, not through politics or shows of strength, not through nation building or assertions of national pride, but through an elitism of humility. It's an election, he writes in the essay written the same year, that it's very much reflecting this, this essay, as our Talmudic passage. He writes, this is the essay is in fact um, in French, it's titled Honor Without a Flag, um, an election that is indeed a hardship and a condition which recalls not only the fragility of every civilization, but the fragility even of conscience which he asserts can only know and justify itself in the, and this is the end of this little essay written at the same year, in the four cubits of the halakha in that precarious divine abode. So I'm gonna close here, but I wanna leave you with a few questions if we have time for discussion. I have to go back to the end now, whoops. Okay. So these are, I, I, I I, I offer you this interpretation of Levinas' Talmudic reading not to endorse it, but to explain it, and also I think as a provocation, and that's why I wanted to end with these final questions that I think the, the, the reading itself helps us think about. So is this teaching of Jewish, is this a teaching of Jewish martyrdom, Levinas' teaching, and in what sense does it make sense of the Holocaust, and is that self a problem, and he's written on this, he writes a very interesting essay against the Odyssey, why he sees his own teaching as very much against the Odyssey. And can you imagine a Zionism consonant with it? What kind of Zionism would that be? I say that as a provocation because in some sense it has to be a kind of religious Zionism, which of course in many ways right now we understand as the force of all the most right-wing forces in Israel. So there's a very interesting tension between the sort of idea of a religious Zionism um, and this idea that, that he, and this he writes continually about, that this prophetic eschatology has to be at the center of Zionism. What might that look like if it doesn't look like what we understand understand religious Zionism to look like right now. Um, and finally, given how Levinas answers the question of the colloquium, does the world need Jews? How would any of us answer that question, especially given the provocation of the question itself? So I will close there, and I hope that we can discuss.